Can everybody see that? Yes? Yep, you're doing very okay. well, yep. And, and hear me, hopefully. OK, good. Uh, so thanks for uh, introducing uh, zero pi qubits and for kicking us off, uh, Michelle, also. Uh, I'm going to be talking about uh, some of the work in our group on high coherent superconducting qubits, focusing on things that are, uh, in some sense, uh, protected, uh, and really focusing on the zero pi qubit. I'm going to really talk about two experiments. One uh, about the zero pi qubit, and and these are the folks that that did that, uh, including my postdoc Andras Ganis, who is uh, starting a faculty job soon at uh, CU Boulder. So send him postdocs and students and things, uh, and with theory support both from Jens and Alexander. Uh, and then on the Floquet qubit, it's really with a lot of theory support from Jens Koch. So, uh, OK. Uh, when we want to build good qubits, uh, we all right now know that we're sort of plagued a little bit by relaxation problems and transmons. And you look at this Fermi's golden rule equation, and you can sort of engineer the matrix element, or you can engineer the noise environment. Uh, and uh, for this talk, we're really going to be talking more about engineering the matrix elements uh, and leaving the, the noise environment uh, constant, right? So, so you can engineer the matrix element by either, uh, by either building a totally new qubit or by uh, sort of driving a traditional qubit in clever ways that sort of uh, mimic, uh, mask which parts of the noise environment you're sensitive to. Uh, or you can Im uh, improve the environment directly by, by working on materials. My group has some nice and recent results uh, on doing that with tantalum qubits that, that have uh, that are both a blessing and a curse for the protected qubit work. Uh, it has renormalized in our group what we what we think of when we think of a good qubit, and so uh, that in some sense has raised the bar. But as we also heard from uh, Dave and Vlad some yesterday, uh, these tantalum devices can also uh, hopefully improve fluxonium and zero pi and the other types of devices that that we're dealing with. Uh, so uh, I've been in my house for for months, and so I'm I'm excited to talk about as many things as I can because uh, because I have all this pent up uh, wanting to talk physics. Uh, so we'll start with the zero pi qubit. And as Robert said, uh, this is a qubit that that uh, uh, that derives its uh, its inherent T one protection not because you've made good materials or because you've made it sort of. Uh, particularly well fabbed, but but from some intrinsic property. And this intrinsic property is that you've encoded the zero and one states in, in, in some sense uh, in, in this phase space picture in disjoint states. And if you have uh, these sort of disjointly supported qubit states, uh, then the matrix element for any local operator is going to be exponentially suppressed. And this means you're going to get really uh, long T1s. This, this word local operator, I think, is actually really interesting, right? Because, uh, because uh, this, this, in some sense, defines some topological quantity where the, the distance of separation in phase space of these states tells you something about how local an operator has to be uh, before it can cause sort of these unwanted bit flips. And I think that has a lot of bearing on these different flavors of zero pi and protected and disjoint qubits. Simultaneously, we'd also like to have uh, you know, our band be flat uh, versus all control parameters. So we have exponentially suppressed uh, fluctuations with regard to T2. Uh, that's been very hard for us. And so we're going to at least settle for the existence of first order protection against T2, uh, so a sweet spot at a place where you simultaneously have this T1 protection through disjointness. Note that one advantage in, in getting your T1 protection not by good fab or by clever materials engineering, but through uh, this sort of intrinsic property is that it's much more likely to lead to a, a better favorable system scaling. Uh, that is, uh, if your T1 is an intrinsic property of your qubit, then if you build 50 of them or 1,000 of them, it's unlikely that you will introduce as many new noise channels. Whereas, uh, for instance, with transmons, you can build one well-isolated transmon, but as you build more and more and more of them, you have to worry about many new channels for decoherence that can, that can decrease T1. OK, uh, so why, what is really going on? I think this gives us a little understanding of why the zero pi qubit works. So, so in some sense, uh, the transmon is good because we have these flat levels. Uh, we have these delocalized charge states, which give us good T2 protection, because delocalization gives you protection. Uh, but we have uh, no disjointness. Uh, in the, in the, in, if you deal with like a flux mode, for instance, like in a fluxonium or a flux qubit, you have multiple wells, and so you could put your qubit logical states in separate wells. Uh, this gives you the disjointness you need to get long T1, uh, but 
at, at a cost of, of this, this heavy localization gives you uh, bad T2 with regard to flux noise. Uh, you could delocalize the qubits in flux space, uh, which gives you a good T2, but now you've given up your disjointness, so you get a bad T1. And in one dimension, you kind of have this fundamental trade-off, and it's very hard to see uh, a way around it. Uh, but if you go into multiple dimensions, then you can mix like a heavy charge mode to give you localization and a light flux mode uh, to give you delocalization, and you can build something uh, like the zero pi qubit, and that's where we're going. Um, so uh, the idea here is to try and combine something that looks like a transmon, which you see on the left, uh, and a flexonium, which you see in the middle. And if you sort of put these things together, uh, then you get this device on the right, which is, of course, uh, the zero pi qubit first proposed now, I guess, almost 15 years ago. Uh, and note that it's a four node circuit, so there's one extra mode, uh, and that is this sort of parasitic uh, cavity-like low frequency mode. Uh, when we were first thinking about this qubit, this is something that troubled us quite a bit. Uh, it actually turns out not to be uh, a, a particularly uh, damaging problem uh, compared to all of the other things we have to deal with. And so, uh, so, so the, the existence of this third mode at the moment is not, uh, is not limiting these devices. Uh, in order to make this work, uh, you need to have very, very, very disparate energy scales. You need to have uh, a high EJ to EC ratio to maintain your transmon-like mode uh, uh, in, 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 the, in the transmon cavity, but you need to have a low EJ to EC ratio uh, in your fluxonium-like mode uh, in order to make, uh, maintain your delocalization. And so sort of simultaneously getting sort of these very large capacitances between these pairs of nodes with no parasitic capacitances between your other pairs of nodes makes the fab uh, really, really challenging. And of course, then you also need very, very, very large inductors. And so we have to put in uh, these, these super inductors. Um, uh, one way uh, Sorry, uh, Daniel has a quick question. Uh, Daniel, uh, do you mind? Yeah, this, this, I'll keep this really brief. It looks like you're trying to indicate the mode shapes by the blue and red dots. Is that just, should I be interpreting that as like, one of those is yeah. red means voltage goes up and blue means voltage goes down. Yeah, 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 yeah. You should think okay. of it like that. And so you can sort of think of the three modes of this circuit as sort of driving the center pin and one of the one of the points of the of the triangle uh, sort of collectively, and then the other two uh, in the opposite way. Okay, thanks. Okay. Uh, and you can think of this device, uh, you know, if you want, as a, as a sort of double Cooper pair tunneling event, uh, like we heard from Robert's talk. So if one electron, uh, sorry, if one Cooper pair tunnels across this left Josephson junction, uh, then it charges up this capacitor, and it really wants to make sort of uh, this sort of charge uh, sort of uh, on the opposite plate of the capacitor. Uh, if this inductor is small, then you know charge can just sort of slosh around. But if the inductor is very, very large, it's hard for Cooper pairs uh, to flow through the inductor. And so the, the best way to sort of uh, create the charge you need on the opposite plate of the capacitor is for another Cooper pair to tunnel across this junction. Uh, and in this way, you get these, this double Cooper pair tunneling uh, uh, object, which we've now seen in sort of a bunch of qubit proposals from, uh, from the sort of uh, rhombus qubits that we've heard about uh, from from Lev to uh, this this recent uh, qubit that Michelle posted, uh, you know I think this 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 four e tunneling is is a really important aspect of these qubits. Okay, so when you do this, uh, what's nice if you if you start to like theoretically draw out your your potentials is is you get things that are that are actually artificial atoms, right? And so uh, we often call our transmons artificial atoms, but they're really like artificial harmonic oscillators with a little bit of anharmonicity. Uh, uh, but here we have actual real like labelings where you can, you know, you can have, you know, a valley index and the number of nodes and an orientation of nodes. And these feel much more atomic like. Uh, and in particular, in one well, we have uh, a zero state uh, and a one state. We have this sort of plasmon ladder. And in the opposite well, we have these doublets that come from the delocalization in flux space. And so the idea of the qubit is that, that these transitions between wells are very, very, very hard to make. So they're well protected. Uh, and we can use uh, the sweet spot that you get from these doublets 
plus one state from the ground state to give us uh, the T1 protection and a first order sweet spot with, re with regard to flux. And so it's not the full zero pi circuit, it's, it's a softer version, right? It's the, it's the exact zero pi circuit. It's not fully into the zero pi parameter regime where you get this true degeneracy, uh, but we'll at least get uh, a first order protection. And as we sort of increase the, the sort of disparate energy scales, we can get more and more protection uh, with, with better and better fab and design. Okay, uh, you can sort of draw, you know, pictures here where you, where if you, if you tune things in flux space, you'll get a, a fluxonium-like dispersion. If you choose things in charge space, you'll get a transmon-like dispersion. And you can sort of pick out the modes that are sort of in, insensitive to flux are the plasmons, that's sort of the things that go up in one well, and the things that are sensitive to flux are the fluxons. Those are the things that cross the well. Uh, and uh, the the magic that happens here is that uh, at uh, this particular uh, at this particular point at zero flux, uh, you lift the degeneracy between these doublets, and you get this splitting, uh, which is what gives you your uh, your protection, uh, your first order protection from flux noise. Um, okay, so uh, we build this thing. It, it's you know with a resonator with a device. The device looks like this. It has two very large capacitors, uh, and then uh, two pair, uh, two super inductors, and then two single junctions. We keep the top half of this and the bottom half of this as far apart as we can to try and minimize uh, any parasitic capacitance, because that's really important in this device. And note that to get very, very, very high capacitance in a compact area, we do something that is uh, that is like horrifying to a transmon person, which is which is we make this this interdigitated capacitor uh, with a really small gap. So it, so in this device, it had about a 700 nanometer gap, uh, and we can do that because. Uh, we don't actually care that much about dielectric loss anymore. And so the plasmon in this device had only a couple microseconds of T1, uh, but the fluxon uh, was well over a millisecond because uh, we're, again, insensitive to this, this sort of charge dissipation. Uh, in, our, in our latest device, we've, which I won't present data with here, but is sort of ongoing, though slightly disrupted by, by COVID, uh, we've actually reduced this gap to down to 250 nanometers to get even more capacitance. This really opens up our sweet spot uh, by another factor of four, which gives us a lot less sensitivity to flux noise. Uh, and we, we, what's amazing is we went down by a factor of three in the gap size. And so we have these incredibly tiny, tiny gaps. Uh, our plasmon T1s went, went way up despite that because we switched to tantalum. And so uh, with this sort of tantalum devices, we can now make these gaps down to uh, only 250 nanometers and still get you know, 12 microseconds of T1 or something. And so, uh, and so even with teeny tiny gaps, we can do, do really well. And this is a way that some of the materials work is now feeding back into making these devices good. Uh, but what's nice here is that we don't actually, you know, for the T1 of this device, we don't actually have to care that much about you know, loss due to these various mechanisms, which I think is, is one of the real promising aspects of protected qubits is that a lot of the, the traditional challenges you face with scaled transmon designs uh, go away. OK, uh, we build this thing. We measure the spectrum. There's a lot of lines. Uh, you, you talk to your theorists, and, and you spend a lot of time fiddling with Hamiltonians. And it turns out that we can sort of identify uh, every more or less line in this whole spectrum. Uh, and if you sort of look at it, uh, what you can see is that, uh, that every line that we want to see is there, except we can't actually identify the fluxon transition, which is the one we really want to use for our qubit. Uh, and that. Uh, is great news because that means that in fact this this transition is protected, uh, and so in order to drive it, we have to use a Raman-like transition. Uh, so we go up to I think the ninth or was it the thirteenth level in this system, uh, which is the first level that has weight in both wells, and we put on two tones to pulse up and down to our our chosen level. Uh, and when you do that, you can sort of uh, map out. Uh, with this outlaw town spectroscopy, you are levels. Uh, and, uh, and in particular, you can map out the transition frequency. And you can see this doublet gap with a, uh, with a, with a sweet spot that protects you uh, to first order from flux noise while maintaining your, uh, your full disjointness for protection from T1. OK, uh, you do that. You can measure the coherence of the qubit. Uh, T1 is 1 and a half milliseconds, so we can get incredibly long T1. Uh, T2s. Are, are sort of only tens of microseconds right now that's dominated by flux noise, uh, but, but it at least demonstrates first uh, that this is possible. 
The gates in this device were slow. Uh, that I think is the, the biggest challenge to these things. Uh, but they were slow for technical reasons because we were driving through the cavity uh, and we were occupying the cavity. In our latest iteration of devices, uh, the, the gates are dramatically sped up by using a parametric drive. And I think you'll uh, see some exciting results in that uh, as soon as we can get back in lab and finish things up. OK. I wanted to pause there and, uh, and or sorry, I want to move on from there and quickly talk about one other set of experiments that's been going on in our lab, which again has to deal with trying to sort of manipulate our sensitivity to various sources of noise. Here we're going to do it not by coming up with a new, a new circuit, uh, but by using uh, an existing circuit, in this case fluxonium, uh, but using it in new regimes. And so uh, we, we said at the beginning that, uh, that we have this protection against T1, uh, which we can get from disjointness. Uh, and in the heavy fluxonium designs, you can get that if you're sort of away from the flux sweet spot. You could also uh, move to a flux sweet spot and you can get good T2, uh, but, uh, but uh, you don't at least have intrinsic protection against T1 anymore. Uh, if you move to a 2D system, uh, then, or, or in our case, it was actually had, had three, three uh, degrees of freedom. But, it, but in, a, in a 2D system, you can get both T1 and T2 protection, which is great. So the question we started asking, uh, again, with Jens Koch's group, uh, was, uh, was whether 1D plus uh, time uh, is enough to give you some, some ability to get some disjointness, uh, some T1 and some T2 protection. That is, uh, can you uh, get some of the advantages of, of, of heavy fluxonium and uh, create sweet spots? Uh, and in fact, uh, the answer is yes. So the idea is that we're going to dress our fluxonium by driving the flux through it in a parametric way. That is, we're going to periodically drive the flux. Uh, when you do that, uh, the easiest way to, to think about this is to solve this uh, time-dependent perturbation, uh, time-dependent uh, Hamiltonian. Uh, and that gives us these, these good Floquet eigenstates uh, that have quasi-energies, which are now basically uh, our, our energy plus or minus uh, integer multiples uh, of our drive frequency. And as you do this, what happens is, uh, is uh, if, you, if you drive, uh, if, you, if you look at where the sort of drive frequencies cause, uh, cause crossings, it turns out that those wind up being anti-crossings, uh, and those allow you to generate uh, dynamic sweet spots. And the question is, that's great, but what happens to the overall coherence of the device? Because now, at, at fluxes away from half a flux, you can open up a dynamic sweet spot. Uh, and so you have to ask, uh, did you win in doing this? And if your noise is, is white, it turns out that you don't really win. Uh, but if your noise is not white, uh, for instance, if you have 1 over f noise, then you can understand it uh, by understanding sort of the, the two things that you are doing in, in doing this experiment. So the first is it is modifying sort of your sensitivity uh, to various, uh, to, to your noise spectrum. This is like essentially modifying your matrix elements. And the second thing you're doing is you're, uh, is you're sampling different frequencies. Uh, and so statically, if you look at this picture at the top right, uh, you can see this pink line shows us what we're sensitive to in terms of T2. That is, we're really sensitive to the low frequency behavior in T2, uh, uh, which away from the, uh, when we're away from the sweet spot. Uh, and that gives us a really low T2 if we have a 1 over S spectrum. And our T1 shows sensitivity at the qubit frequencies. If we drive it dynamically and we work at a dynamical sweet spot, then we are not sensitive. Uh, our, our matrix element is zero at low frequencies, but we get sensitivity at sort of these uh, at these higher frequencies. And then similarly, uh, uh, for for depolarization channels, we now uh, have uh, sensitivity uh, at sort of multiples of, of the drive frequency plus your, your original frequency. And so you're sort of changing what parts of the spectrum you're sensitive to. Uh, but if you do this well, you can make sure that you don't put any particular sensitivity of your T1 in the low frequency part of the spectrum and make sure that your T2 gets a dynamical sweet spot. And in total, this allows you to sort of put uh, these dynamical sweet spots where you want. And so we do this by, by creating a fluxonium device. Uh, we drive it uh, with both a DC offset to the flux and a, a parametric uh, part of this, which we, we drive at some particular drive frequency. Uh, you can sort of 
uh, parameterize this in some uh, unit agnostic way. And what you see is that if you look at T2 in the top, uh, or, or yeah, T5 in the top, uh, you get these long sweet spots or sweet lines uh, where you get uh, where you get essentially crossings between the different quasi energy levels, which give you these dynamical sweet spots, and you only really see bad T1 when you have some matrix element, some part of your spectrum that you're sensitive to appear at zero frequency, which are what these dotted white line cutouts are. So if you work along one of these lines away from the T1 cutouts, you can get a very, very small degradation in T1, uh, but get a large improvement uh, in T2. Uh, and so uh, we do this experiment so you can map out the spectrum of a bare fluxonium. We turn on our parametric drive, and you can see these flow K states appear. Uh, and then you can start to map out these flow K states as a function of either uh, the DC offset or the, the AC amplitude. And what you can see is that we open up sweet spots away from uh, zero flux. Uh, and we can also simultaneously get sweet spots in terms of the AC amplitude, which turns out to be important because uh, the amplitude of our flux drive varied a little bit. And so we wanted a sweet spot with that as well. Uh, and so what we do is we find uh, the, the sweet spot in our real parameter space where we're insensitive uh, to DC flux by the, 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 these dynamical sweet spots. We then also find the sweet spots where we're insensitive to uh, AC noise. That is, if the, if the amplitude of our Floquet AC drive is changing, we're insensitive to that as well. Uh, and if you add those together, uh, then you can find the place where you're insensitive to both. And then we can map out this sweet spot. Um, and what I want to show is just uh, just quickly uh, that if we do this, as we change the modulation strength, the modulation frequency, uh, uh, and the modulation strength, then we can map out this sweet spot uh, where we find uh, uh, insensitivity both to the AC strength and uh, the AC modulation strength and the AC amplitude. Uh, and at that point, we see T2 go up by a factor of 40. Uh, compared to the T2 of the qubit away from uh, the, the flux sweet spot. Uh, we see a, a reduction of about a factor of three and a half uh, for T1, but a 40 times improvement for T2. Uh, and so overall, this allows us to get a T1 and a T2, which right now are only in the 20, uh, both in the 20 microseconds uh, region, but it at least shows that this approach works in principle. So we can cancel out uh, 1 over F spectrum by using these flow K drives uh, as a new way of sort of harnessing the power of these qubits. Okay, so uh, I just want to sum up here and say uh, again that we we built this uh, zero pi or this light zero pi qubit uh, that gives us uh, protection against uh, against T1. We've we've gotten above a millisecond in T1 and simultaneously maintained a flux sweet spot. We've gotten a, 40, a factor of 40 improvement for T2 by using these Floquet drives. Uh, and of course, everything will get better as we now go back and incorporate our tantalum bin films uh, to, to make a lot of these processes better. So thanks. And again, uh, these are the folks, the important folks, uh, who, who did all the actual work. So. Well, great. Um, so we have our first question from uh, John Martinez. Yeah. Uh, OK, thanks. Um, so I'm um, I'm trying to understand um, the zero pi qubit a little bit more, and the question goes along the line that we know about flux qubits and fluxonium for a long time, where we had a double well potential, and you can use those qubits where you have non-overlapping uh, wave functions so that T1 is very long, uh, yeah. and then of course the, the the killer is the flux noise because then you could phase noise. And I, I'm just trying to understand in, in the zero pi phase cube and other things, what new are you going on? Because qualitatively, it looks very, very similar. Yeah. So the, the idea is that you have two dimensions. The idea is that you have sort of your, your computational state happening between two wells that, that essentially don't have a loop between them. These are wells that, that, uh, that, that aren't in the flux loop. Uh, this is this uh, this 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 double well that you get from. Oh, oh, oh. I, I understand that, and yet when I look at the circuits, there are loops. Ah, right. 
<laughs> you also have a boot, right? So there are flux, there is flux sensitivity. So that I can understand. So that loop is in the other direction. And so in fact, you 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 bias that loop at a flux sweet spot, which gives you no disjointness, but it's no disjointness going up the ladder out of your computational, out of your computational space. Uh, and so you're basically your ground state is in one well, and then your excited state is 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 a state that is not itself disjoint, but it's the lowest possible energy state in that well. And so you can't drive transitions further down the well because of its lack of disjointness. And so rather than using uh, two states that are not disjoint from each other and having transitions that are allowed from them or or two states that are that are sort of not disjoint and tra and transitions out of the hilbert space that's sort of the lowest it can go there but all of that is sort of built on top of this other existing state in the other direction which is what you use as your zero state so what you get over over the the traditional flux qubit is it's like you can use the lower energy uh, uh, the lowest energy of the of the sort of symmetric and anti-symmetric superposition that you get from the flux state. So you get your uh, for, uh, from your flux qubit when you're at degeneracy. So you get your protection against flux noise, but you have this whole other level that sits below that you can't transition down into. And so it's it's the fact that you get these two dimensions that allow you to have both of those at the same time. Okay, thank, thanks for that. But the second question is a little bit um, uh, related to this in that you have non-overlapping wave functions to get really long, let's say T1 coherence times, but then you, you need to do gate operations. And then to do gate operations, you have to break that no overlap. And the problem is, is when you do a quantum algorithm, you run error correction, you're spending more than 50% of your time doing gate operations. So uh, are you really gaining anything uh, by spending part of your time in these protected states. So I think I think the answer is uh, right now. The answer is obviously no. Nothing beats uh, nothing beats a, a, a good coherence, well built transmon. Uh, the answer in the long run is maybe uh, because what you can do is you can you know we have these Raman drives right, and so when you turn these on, obviously you're connecting these two levels. Uh, but you're doing it in a way that that now requires a particular combination of uh, of frequency elements in your environment. And so the idea is, you know, the way that you couple these states is something that you can artificially produce and maybe even quickly. Uh, in our in our zero pi paper that's posted on the archive, our gates were actually quite slow and and not that good. Uh, we've we've gotten them more than an order of magnitude faster now just by thinking about better ways to actually to actually break this. And so the, the idea is uh, is that you can drive these gates with a particularly unusual set of, of frequencies that that don't occur naturally uh, and maybe and maybe win in the in the long run. Um, I think the, the other thing is, is, you know, because you have this protection, this, this idea that, you know, you now no longer, you know, the system scaling might work quite a bit better than the individual qubit scaling, I think is important, right? So, uh, so building one good transmon, as, as, as I'm sure you more than anyone can attest, is a heck of a lot harder than building uh, 53. Uh, and the hope is that for these protected qubits, which gain their coherence for intrinsic reasons, that scaling might be much more favorable. If we can ever build one that's good enough to try. Yeah, and I, I guess what, what always concerns me is you have to, in these Raman transitions, you're driving overlapping states, and those will decohere, and then you have to do lots of experiments to understand that and get quickly. But I, I understand the strategy. Thank you. All right. Are there any other questions? All right. Well, we'll have a, a short break right now. We'll come back and at uh, the 15 minute mark. And uh, thank you, Andrew uh, and Rob, uh, Robert for presenting. Um, and maybe if Robert, if you 